Good afternoon. I'm Toni Wellen. Uh, I am founder and chair since 1994 of the Coalition Against Gun Violence, which is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, Santa Barbara County Coalition with over 40 partner organizations. We are nonpartisan and view the issue of gun violence as a political and public health concern. As a nonprofit organization, the coalition focuses on all aspects of gun violence and violence in general and community safety. We have been working for 20 years to create a safer community and to raise the awareness of the potential dangers of firearms through education. I am here not as a representative of the Coalition Against Gun Violence, but as an individual. Um, uh, I met Jackie uh, in 2009 at the Youth Empowerment for Safety Fair, the, the Yes Fair. And I met you then, and uh, you were at that time involved with Esperanza. Uh, do you want to say something about Esperanza? Of course. Esperanza was a movement. And in 2009, there were a lot of youth violence crimes one of which was uh, heavily followed by media, which was what happened here locally in 4th of July. Uh, and that mobilized a lot of the families that were directly impacted by youth violence. They wanted to create systemic changes in their community. So we created Esperanza as a way to brainstorm ideas on both sides of town, both the east side and the west side, and throughout the community that was really impacted by, by all of these issues. And at that point, it was not focused on community agencies. It was focused on getting families that were victims of crime, getting families that were, uh, were causing these crimes together in the same room to brainstorm solutions. And in the east side and in the west side, we did that. We had over 250 families participate in these brainstorming ses sessions. And it was quite amazing because at the end we realized that we had one thing in common and that was that everybody was hurt by youth violence and nobody wants gangs in our community. So how do we address that is by giving those families the ability to say here are common problems that nobody knows except for our community and how do we address them is they developed their own solutions. They created a report which took a few months to put together and it was really focused on the criminal justice system and things that could be easily modified to create systemic changes that would better positively impact families and youth. Also with school district, they looked at possible changes that could happen within the structure of the school district to help our youth go into college and, and do better things, and with nonprofits. It was very interesting to see the point of view of these families that were, at that point, pleading for help. And they really weren't focused too much on nonprofits, how, how they function now. They wanted the kind of nonprofits that could help the entire family and that could help an entire community heal. And that was a little different than what we had then. And it's definitely still the same structure now. but. It was a way to be able to create a voice. And that's what we did with Esperanza, which is why it was called Movimiento Esperanza. It was one of the first 501c4, 501c3s that I, that I helped to, to fund. And really it was to try to make that voice in a very um, clear-cut process and in a way that families and community, and especially those elected into office, could really hear. Of course, when you have such a big request, it takes some time to put it together. And, and, and so it uh, unfortunately has not met uh, the kind of fruition we would like to see in the community. But I, I'm sure that with that kind of focus group mentality, we could redirect those kinds of conversations now that we have district elections and it's much more neighborhood based and try to bring some of those ideas forth. Well, we did the um, Yes Fair two years in a row and it was really wonderful to see 
uh, the after-school programs that the kids were involved in that were so positive and um, kept kids really involved and off the streets. But there, there were two other entities and, that you and I have been involved uh, with. Um, uh, one of them is the Santa Barbara Response Network. Uh, I had training in uh, psychological first aid with you, with Dr. Macy. Uh, you have continued to be a strong member of that very important organization. I'll give you a little story. The Santa Barbara Response Network was actually created by neighborhood families. There was a point in that transgression of youth violence where the youth that were committing the violence started to kill themselves. And the families and the neighborhood and even the schools were so heavily impacted with these kids committing suicide one right after the other that we quickly brought in mental health, we brought in the partnerships with the schools, we brought in the partnerships with probation, and we were able to pull together what families wanted, which was to stop this kind of cluster suicide and to provide other alternatives. And mostly what they were asking for is to decrease the crisis that was going on in the neighborhoods and decrease the, the sense for these youth that if gangs weren't an, an alternative, that this was the only other option away from a gang. And so folks like you and hundreds of other people in the community stepped up and took that training. And we brought in uh, Robert Macy, who was a voice that could be reckoned with because he met with those families and he got their ideas together. And the response network, the way that I saw it working in the long run was where we hope to take a systemic kind of approach in which where the police department goes out into crisis and goes out and responds to either suicides or homicides, that a card is left with the family, both victims and offenders, because of course they're, they're in the same crisis, and they're told, maybe this response network is gonna contact you and we're gonna make the referral, they'll contact you within 24 hours. And then that response network goes in de-escalates the crisis and gets people calm enough to then refer them to an agency that can provide the long-term care that they might need or the advocacy that they might need. And the reason why that's important for me is because when it comes to law enforcement, our communities go into despair. And if you are in a family where somebody's getting arrested, the very first thing is you want to find somebody else to point the finger at. And it's not because it's just a natural instinct, it's because you're in crisis. So if you have somebody going in and de-escalating that crisis, instead of pointing the finger at an officer, going, oh, that officer maybe put the handcuffs on too tight, then maybe they'll start really focusing on the issues of their home and they can start to get care for the other children that are in that home that are witnessing all of this violence around them. And that's the whole point. And I hope that in the future we can start to really look at things in a more systemic way. And that's one of the reasons why the Santa Barbara Trauma Response Network came around. It was kids from the neighborhood who said, hey, we need help. And the community stepped up. And where I played a role in it is because I, I grew up in this neighborhood. So for me, helping with the community, it was easy enough because I had already built the trust of the community and I could say, hey, here's a place where we could get training and you can feel safe enough to come to me. And I became a bridge between those folks coming in to get this kind of training and then the mental health folks and folks like yourself and the other folks in the community like probation to get the same kind of training and we met right in the middle. And it was beautiful. Uh, the other thing that um, I wanted to emphasize about the Santa Barbara Response Network is that any type of crisis, if it's a, um, an auto accident or a heart attack where people need support, the Santa Barbara um, Response Network will send out an email to all of us and say, we need people, and all those people who have been trained can respond uh, if they're able to be there. And that's what the Response Network does now. 
I am still on the board and want to make sure that that's a thriving nonprofit and that it works for its for for what it needs to do, which is respond to emergencies. But we have incident commanders and people that are very well trained, people from the community that will go out and respond. And when there's a big crisis, like the, for example, the 154 incident with the trucks, mm -hmm. yes, we went out and we set up a response. And not only was it a response to that family and to those families that were directly impacted, it was a response that needed to happen for all of the schools. With the IV mass shooting, which happened last year, same thing. We activated the response network and went out not to the students from IV, but to all of the community that has to live there, to all of the business owners that witnessed this whole thing go down and had to strap on their boots and go to work the next day. And that was beautiful because it was an activation of bringing in community, telling those folks in the community, hey, here's somebody that trusts you, that you can trust. Let's connect those two things together. And bringing in mental health was a way to get the psychological first aid, to get the folks in the community like you and myself and other folks directly connected with those people and bringing them in was how the response network does. And we set up what we call compassion centers. Yes, compassion tents. Yeah, and that's what they were. They were a place where people could debrief in their lunch break mm -hmm. while they were coming to drop off their kids in the middle of the vigils. And also with everything that happened in Goleta, not too sh you know, shortly after that as well with that family, going out to that neighborhood, giving them a place that they could go under a tent and debrief and just say, I need a place to really talk about this. Uh, the other um, arena, we don't have to talk about it uh, as extensively, but we've been um, here and there met at the Santa Barbara Women's Politi Political Committee, which has been in, in existence for over 25 years. And uh, you have a role in that organization? I do. I am a, a board member. Right now I'm on leave because of, of course, the middle of this campaign. But I have been an active board member with the Women's Political Committee, and it's because I believe and stand in getting women into office, getting young women at the age of 13, 14 years old, thinking that they might have an opportunity to maybe do something in their community and run for office in the future. I love the ability to get together with folks and start to ask them, so are you ready to run yet? <laughs> And, and it, sometimes it takes a long time for women to step up and do it because it's a hard thing to be put out there. Yes, it's empowering it to is. women in the community, and we need that. That's right. Um, the other thing that we are uh, working together uh, on is the called the, the Safe Storage Law. Um, the Safe Storage Law is AB 231, and it went into effect in 2014. It makes uh, someone criminally liable if they negligently store or leave any loaded firearm on the premises in their home where a child, anyone eight, under 18, is likely to gain access uh, to it, whether or not the, the gun is brought into a public space. Uh, keeping our children safe is a shared run responsibility that starts with educating parents and guardians about proper, responsible storage of any firearm in the home. It's the parent's responsibility. You do not tell your child, don't touch the gun. You keep the gun unloaded, locked, and separate from the ammunition, which is locked in a separate place. Uh, State Superintendent Torlickson is encouraging every school district in California to get this message out to parents. There is a school shooting every week in America. And um, how are we going to get this word out to all of the members of our community? Well, this is what's important to me. Getting a connection between our council and our school board so that we can clearly work together. I think the school board and city council meet about once a year and they cover different things like facilities and grants and contracts that they work together with. But we need to go beyond that. And the reason for that is because we do have Parks and Rec and they offer wonderful programs. 
but we're not getting to those parents. This is where we can use the opportunity to expand to the nonprofits, to sit down with council, and to really push school board members to take these kinds of projects into the next level and access the resource and the partnership with our Parks and Rec Department to provide the education and provide the space for those parents. So it's not just a, I'm coming to pick up my child, but it, it becomes more of an educational moment. And it's not something that can happen once. It's not a workshop. Oh, it's, it's a partnership, yeah. right? And it's, it's continuous education. But it's education not only to the youth, to those kids, but to those families. And if we continue to give the message out in a consistent way throughout the school district in partnership with our Parks and Rec and in partnership with our, with our city council, kind of pushing that message, then we can get to many folks that may be isolated from our general sources. Yeah, we can need to get parents to also uh, ask when their child goes to someone's home. We need to get them to ask, is there a gun there and how is it stored right. and we need to help parents right. learn how to do that. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, has been very successful um, in our city which is brand new is um, the Santa Barbara City gun buyback which um, we did in partnership with the Santa Barbara Police D Department. Uh, the first year, um, last year 2014, we collected 237 fire firearms, and this year we collected 2,007. Uh, people received a $100 debit card, uh, and it's, these are credible numbers. And we're hoping that uh, we can be successful in encouraging the city of Santa Barbara to fund future gun buybacks, uh, as do other cities. Uh, what would your role on the city council be in that regard? Well, let me take it a step back. The reason why I got involved with the gun buyback was a very personal reason to me. I grew up in foster care, and when I turned 18, I obtained my foster care license to work with teenagers. And my very first teenage foster boy, when he grew up, he moved on to Santa Maria like most people do. It's much more affordable. Uh, and on his way home from work, he was shot. He was found dead in the bushes around the corner from his apartment. And it was devastating because we never had closure to that. And it was almost like one of those forgotten cases where as a family you can go, okay, what's wrong with the system? How come we're not coming up with who, who the perpetrator here was? But rather than focus on that, I started to think what might work better in our community, and a gun buyback makes the most perfect sense. It gives people the power to relinquish their weapons when they don't want them at home, when there are other people that maybe might misuse them, and that they're properly disposed of. And it's not a law. You're not getting rid of guns and making it part of the First Amendment or anything like that. You're giving people options, and that's what it's about. It's about giving our community options. Now. I love and welcome the fact that the nonprofit stepped up and did it the first year, and that we did it again the second year without a crisis, and we still had about the same amount of numbers. And not only that, but we were able to access the Latino community with radio and free advertising and things like that, and we did have some Latino families going and dropping off guns this year, which didn't happen the year before. Yeah. Now, I do think that we do have to step it up with council and we have to make a couple of commitments to this kind of effort, which they have in Los Angeles, and it's the city who takes it on. It would be awesome to see that our council starts to move into maybe picking this up with partnerships, of course, with our nonprofit, but takes it so that it's part of the system of the city of Santa Barbara because they can crank up more advertising and, and, and go out and connect to the community with the Parks and Rec and go out and distribute the information much more effectively than maybe one nonprofit can. So I can see the transition into that next phase. And that's what I hope to do as well in council. Um, many times when there is a, um, a shooting, people talk about 
uh, the perpetrator as having mental health issues. But most of the time, um, nothing is done about this. However, in Santa Barbara, um, when we had the shooting in Isla Vista, uh, within six months, AB 1014, which was authored by Nancy Skinner and our own Doss Williams, um, it, uh, pass, it's a law that is modeled after our state's domestic violence restraining order. This is called the gun violence restraining order, and it's a court order to, re to temporarily limit for one year, unless reviewed, uh, the individual's access to firearms when there are signs or indications that the person is at risk for violence. And this was certainly true uh, with the um, individual uh, in Isla Vista. And it establishes a method uh, to when a person is demonstrating that they are emotionally unstable to remove the gun from them so that these things don't happen. Um, and how uh, should you, the city council handle this situation? I think it was handled beautifully because it was handled quickly enough to get something done, to make it tangible, that there wasn't a success in this tragedy. And the tangible success with, was regional partnership, mm -hmm. was having folks on council back something that Doss Williams was putting together that was supported in many different realms of the, of the county. And that there wasn't a pushback because our community felt like it was necessary. There's a partnership that we can continue to grow on and, and that's the focus of a council person, is to listen to the community whatever the need might be, whether it's disaster, whether it's fire, listen to a community, provide the resource, give them a moment to step back so that they can come into their own creativity of partnership and then back them on something. And whether that's a change in ordinance or whether that's supporting legislation, that's what a council person should be doing. Well, in that same vein, um, there is a law which is called Laura's Law which um, the county is grappling with. Uh, it, the majority of Santa Barbarans do support this law. It's about people who are uh, extremely mentally ill and impaired, and they, they, they know they're ill and need treatment, but they don't often get it. They become, they are arrested, and we call it the revolving door. Uh, it costs the city money, uh, and if we had Laura's Law, which is supported by some people on the, um, on the, in the Board of Supervisors, along with NAMI, the National Association of the Mentally Ill, um, this would enable more people who are severely mentally ill to be off the streets, and these are people who are usually homeless. Well, my involvement with it has been pretty much from the get-go. I've been trying to get our county and all of our community to understand what that is. What is Laura's Law and what are the flaws or the detriments of not informing the community of what it could do? It is a law that already exists. We just have to implement it within the county. And it's something that we can do regionally. But it does take partnership and it takes partnership with mental health. It takes partnership with other organizations like housing, and it takes partnerships with basic needs community members that are willing to step up and provide case management with, through the Family Resource Centers. So what a beautiful partnership if our city council was able to open up those community centers and give access to case management and give access to some of the mental health services that county mental health could provide and become a safety net. That's how I see Laura's Law. It's a safety net. Yes. It catches mm -hmm. folks before they're in crisis, before they're hurting themselves in community. And of course, it catches them in that middle between needing the emergency service and falling into probably suicide or homicide, right? Speaking of suicide, um, 19 to 20,000 people a year commit suicide um, with a gun. It's the 10th leading cause of death. Uh, we don't have any local uh, statistics 
uh, about that, but the no, we know that 22 veterans commit suicide each day, and we have lots of veterans in our community, and suicide by gun is usually fatal. We need to pay attention to this issue of suicide, which you have mentioned before. Right. Well, you know, for me, it's all about not only the suicide to the individual and their family, but how that impacts the rest of the community. And so our veterans do need help. But it's because, in a lot of cases, it's respect. It's feeling like they're being respected. They're going off to war. They're fighting something that is beyond our control and our understanding. And they come home to their basic laundromat jobs. I've had lots of folks that go out and they, they have different positions in the Army and in services. And they come in and they're like, I get paid minimum wage and I'm going back to a place where I used to be the manager in a laundromat. Well, lastly, we want to focus on violence against women and rape. Um, we know that one in four college students uh, are raped. And we have three colleges in our community. And what are we going to do to keep women safe? Safety to women is important. And where we can do the best in council is making sure that we have the resources and that the foundations are partnering with us to continue to support things like the Rape Crisis Center and services like Domestic Violence Solutions. That we are addressing violence at every level, including education, including our Parks and Rec Division. That youth and that children understand how bullying really does hurt in many ways and that families understand their role in that. So it's really about prevention. But of course, when it comes to college, there's a whole slew of college members that come in. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate to look, especially at my district, when only 50% of our kids graduate with a high school diploma. Most of those kids don't go on to college. In fact, only 8% do. And that's a, that's a very alarming number because that means that the kind of services that we need to provide are right in the colleges for all of those students that come into Santa Barbara that stay here to get their education. But we also need to boost up our numbers in our own education system. So again, I can say that over and over again, but I could imagine all of the wonderful things we could do in our community centers. For the students that come in from outside the city, we need to boost up our partnerships with, this, with the Santa Barbara City College and, and the university, which we have done. Well, it has been really enjoyable talking with you, Jackie, about uh, safety in the community and uh, encourage, I'm encouraged by your words. Thank you. I appreciate the, the time and, and the listeners that are out there. And I could just say that as a local person and as a person who's always advocated for things, we're going to get things done in the city. And now that we have districts, we can definitely get more grassroots orientation and getting our local youth involved and, and off, off into maybe potential political office in the future, right? Right. Good talking with you. Thank you. <laughs>